But if it went for, you know, if it did not But it would be the We pay a little extra to do the, uh, the meet uh, the, um, something MLK is like the end of the week, the meet the meet up. Uh, <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. 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 Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Wow, it's so great to hear uh, all those cheerful voices answering back. Uh, are a few of you tired, though, even though you're sounding cheerful? No. Not me. Did you have a good time last night? Woo! Yeah. My name is Monique Kreber, uh, otherwise known as Michelle's mom. And in these parts. And uh, I'm going to be moderating this panel. I, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Mr. William Anderson. Thank you. And Ms. Tina Duong. Those of you who are familiar with the hundredth episode, how many of that? Uh, how many of you might say you're familiar with? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, for those of you who are familiar, then uh, you are also familiar with uh, Tina's lovely cellist styling. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and uh, what we'll do is uh, we'll get uh, Tina and William to. Um, a little bit of, uh, about what they've been working on and uh, some things like that, and then we will open the floor to questions. Uh, Andrew, where would you like the microphone for questions to be? You'll set it up over there? Okay, so we'll, that, we'll have a light up over there after we have some questions, and uh, then we'll go from there. So, uh, first of all, these two people are extraordinarily busy and successful musicians here in the LA area. And uh, they are working, uh, William, of course, is working extensively on My Little Pony, but he also has um, many other projects that he's working on. And maybe you can tell everybody a little bit of uh, highlights of, of things that you've had happening. Well, uh, My Little Pony and Equestria Girls is, is a life sentence. Um, <laughs> <laughs> in the very best way. I'm so grateful for the show and the work. But um, there's, there's not a lot of time in my life for, for too much else. Uh, but I have been doing some, uh, a lot, I've been writing a lot of personal songs, and I'm working on a new Disney show that's, uh, should I talk about other shows? Well, I am, I, I will. Uh, it's called <laughs> Yokai Watch. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it's, it's from right. Japan, and the video that they have in Japan is 99 million hits or something. It's a huge Whoa. show. Yeah. It's going to be on in a couple of months, and they've hired me to do all the, uh, they were struggling with the uh, English versions of the songs, and they came to me after a couple other people, and, and uh, so I produced the singers and kind of pumped the tracks up and had a lot of fun working on it, and they loved what I did. So now I'm doing a whole bunch of songs for Yokai Watch, and that's a lot of fun. And still real busy on on uh, My Little Pony. I finished the third Equestria Girls movie, um, I don't know, sometime in the near past. And I've been just relentlessly forward on season five of My Little Pony, and I'm in the middle of episode 20 right now. Mm -hmm. And um, other than that, um, I've been busy with other stuff, but I can't remember. And you guys know what I'm doing, and, and, and Tina has a lot of fun stuff going on. So, um, Tina? Hi. Hey, hey Tina. <laughs> really, really excited when William uh, contacted me. He actually emailed me, and we hadn't known each other before, so he wrote me an email and he said, hey, I'm William, do you want to play cello on My Little Pony? And I said, yes! <laughs> <laughs> I just cold emailed her. I, 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 I said, I said, Tina, well, was very good, and I found her website, and I emailed her cold, uh, just to her website like a fan. Hi, my name is Will, and I'm writing music for my little you want to come play. It was total, not Hollywood. <laughs> It was a lot of fun, and so uh, I had a great time working with Will and getting to know him and becoming friends. And 
I'm super excited that you know we were asked to perform here. We're performing tonight for the opening of Club Luna at seven o'clock. Woo! Yeah. That's be fun. Um, so, uh, so I play cello for a living. I started playing cello when I was seven years old. Both my parents are music teachers and they're Chinese, so you can imagine my <laughs> um, So I played a lot of cello eight hours a day, but now I'm really oh grateful God. for it and um, I'm a full time musician. I live in Los Angeles and I do a few different things. So I play, I still play classical cello and I still tour as a soloist with different orchestras. I have a few concerto concerts coming up. Um, in the spring, and then my other passion is uh, heavy metal, so I love playing Ooh, nice. yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I, I just released a metal album uh, last month, actually, in August, called, I know it's very, very creative, it's called Cello Metal. Cello <laughs> Metal. <laughs> and, uh, do you guys know who John Five is? Ooh. Ooh. Marilyn Manson, uh, Wes Bromley from Limp Bizkit, and so I have a lot of friends, um, guests, up here playing guitar on all these songs. I did covers Ooh. of Metallica, Iron Maiden, guitar, and all the classics and some original music. So I do metal on that side. Um, I was in the circus. I was in the circus light for two years, uh, from 2011 to 2013. Uh, they did, I don't know if any of you um, even heard about it or saw it, but it was called the Michael Jackson The Immortal World Tour. It was an arena tour uh, around the world. And uh, basically after Michael passed away, unfortunately, um, the Jackson stays with family and they're like, oh my god, what are we going to do? We were supposed to do a tour. Like, this is it. It was supposed to be the tour. So, we're like, let's partner up with the circus and <laughs> make a new hybrid show. So, the circus play and the Jackson State came together and made this big, weird, like, acrobats and contortionists and Michael's original band from the Bad Era. They put together the whole original band, added a random electric cello player for whatever reason. Um, <laughs> and so that was a lot of fun. And then in LA, so getting to uh, movies and TV and video game um, scoring and playing. So I, I'm trying to think, like I've worked on some different projects. Uh, for movies, I, I was a soloist on uh, Inception, on Sherlock Holmes, Iron Man 2. Uh, yeah. CSI New wow. like lots of right, random TV shows, and uh, for video games, I, I don't know if it's okay to talk about it yet, but I, I did play the electric cello solos on Call of Duty Black Ops 2, uh, and there's a new one coming out soon, and I just have to play it. And uh, Journey, and uh, uh, a lot of Blizzard, I'm, I'm also going to be at the next BlizzCon if anyone's going to that, um, Ooh, doing a like uh, that for StarCraft. Diablo. Anyway, just stuff. Okay. <laughs> stuff. <laughs> what, about, what about Hans Zimmer and Superman versus? Uh... Uh, sure. Uh, uh, we're, we're currently working on Batman versus. What? What? that a lot of people ask is uh, how you know how you came to be involved with the show. That's kind of a common question that comes up a lot, and uh, there, I'm sure there's people in this audience who don't know uh, your story for that. So how about uh, a little bit of uh, background? Okay, I uh, have done animation for uh, most of my career for over 20 years, and so I have uh, um, you know a name to for scoring animation. And when My Little Pony was being reimagined with uh, Lauren and Hasbro up at DHX in Vancouver and the hub was around. Um, they tested, it was a, a small invitation of composers and it was what's called a blind listening test. They gave us all uh, a minute and a half to score and uh, it wasn't an open invitation. They invited like six, eight people and we all scored and then they listened to a, what's called blind and that means they didn't know who the composer was that they were listening to, and they chose mine, and uh, that's how I got the gig. 
<laughs> That's also how Daniel got the uh, songwriting gig. I also tested a, you know, I did a song as well. Daniel did songs and underscore, and, and but they loved, and I loved Daniel's songs too. And I forget the first one he, he wrote. It was a, um, it was it was for Pinkie Pie. Uh, I don't think it was a smile song on the test, but uh, I can't pull it up just because I sometimes get stage shy. But it was great, you know, and, and so that's how I got the, the show. Nice. Woo! <laughs> I have no idea if go on And uh, we started scoring them like little movies, you know. I, 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 you know, you can use library, but we just started. We took an orchestral scoring approach and and we still score every single episode. Every, every, you know, I, I spend two and a half hours as soon as I get the cut, just making detailed spotting notes uh, of every everything that I think is right. And I go over it with Jason or the director that's working with him, and then we score it and, and move on. And we still, you know, we don't use much library uh, unless unless it's just absolutely um, perfect. And in fact, in this show, we uh, we are uh, Jason tempt in. I don't get a lot of temp music. Temp music is when Oh, God. <laughs> Maybe you can explain to them what library means. And, uh... You know, if you've done two or three seasons of an animated show, often they catalog everything you've written and they just a music editor will cut it in and you don't have to do any more original score. And usually because, you know, the characters don't change show to show and the situations are largely the same and the story editing and, and writing overview, you know, they have an arc and a template they work off. So often, you, you know, the score will work music editing. Recycling. Yeah, recycling, but we, we don't do that. We score them all. Wow. It's fun. Dang. It's, it's a lot of work. Like Woo! Yeah. 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 And uh, Tina already explained how uh, she became involved with the show, but did you already know about uh, My Little Pony and the popularity of the show when you received the email from Lillian? Um, well, of course, I think everybody knows My Little Pony. Um, so I, knew, I knew about My Little Pony, but I had never seen the show. Um, and I mean, I think it was popular. So it's, to me, it was almost something like, I don't know, like Coca Cola or the Beatles, and, you know, <laughs> popular culture. Uh, yeah, everybody knows about it, but it's been really fun. So, I mean, I literally, I only played on one song. I just, you know, I just didn't really do that much, but um, like the fans and the people who were into the show were so warm and awesome and nice. And people, I remember, started like tweeting and stuff, and I was like, oh, cool. Um, so, yeah, it's been a really, really cool uh, eye opening experience. Be kind of drawn into this, this world. When Tina says she didn't play that much, if you've heard the track where she plays, <laughs> I don't think a lot of people can play like that. <laughs> her, her, her technique and ability is pretty astounding. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> She'll say you later. <laughs> <laughs> it was really liberating as a composer, too, because I listened to after she said, yeah, I'll play. And then I went, I listened to a bunch of her stuff actually before and I go, good Lord, I can write anything that I want. <laughs> <laughs> it really frees you as a composer. Yeah, that's awesome. And William, when did you become aware of the fact that a fandom was building up uh -huh. for the show? That everybody uh, involved in the show usually has a, a moment when they go, oh, oh, it's going to be something different than what I expected going into it. It was for a long time because, uh, because I live in my cave. <laughs> Everybody was saying, you know, the show's doing really well. We're getting, but it was it was in season two or towards the end of season two, and I, the show was a big hit. And um, really, didn't I, I went to the Evergreen Brony uh, the conference in, in Seattle? That's where yeah, we yeah, right. And that was when I was astonished when I got into the hotel and I was just surrounded. <laughs> and it took 45 minutes to get to my room. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I was, it was astonishing. I had no idea. So if you have questions, why don't we have you start uh, lighting up over here? And uh, I think Andrew's going to supply us with a microphone. Or is there one there? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, we'll have to line up on this side. And... Um, And yeah, why don't we, why don't we uh, have the first person proceed right now? Sure, go ahead. <laughs> What's that? Oh, the mic's right there. Anything. Okay, uh, <laughs> you can ask anything 
that uh, you want that's appropriate, and that it, <laughs> it has nothing to do with things that have not been aired yet. They can't Spoilers. answer anything that is still confidential. Okay? Grab the microphone and fire away. <laughs> Actually, you know, we can, can we, uh, you can take it, to, take a, if you want to demo it, it'll be easier if we don't have room. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead with your question. I think it's a wireless mic. Just pull it out of there, hold the mic, turn it on. There, there, there. there you go. Now sing. You're supposed to sing. Do you have a question? You can sing your question. I have a question. Who is the best singer in My Little Pony? Well, that's a better question for Daniel, but don't the vocals sound great on every single song? <laughs> yeah, woo! <laughs> Next. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> well, I, I really, I mean, you know, I mean, that's that's really my answer. <laughs> I'm sorry. Next. Thank you very much. <laughs> Can I have you take the whole microphone stand and just walk a little bit that way, just so it's, you guys don't have to walk so far to get to it? Just not right in front of the speaker. Right That's probably good, right? It's there. right there. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. All right, I got a question for you. Yes. <laughs> you. Yes. <laughs> so, you said you played um, soundtracks for Call of Duty Black Ops 2, right? Yes. Okay. Um, did you ever get to meet a person named David Mondahar? If you did, did you think he was a nice person? I've never met David. I hope he's a nice person. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he did something with the game that did, that got everyone like really mad. So. What? What did he do? Um. Well, you see, there's a community for the game called the Sniper Community. Yeah. Yeah, and people basically make YouTube videos about it, so mm -hmm. they can make a little bit of it. But what he did is that he slowed down the the fire rate, basically make the sniper shoot slower. Okay. So that made a lot of people angry. You got a lot that's, of that's weird. Yeah. No, I don't know him, but if I ever meet him, I'll slap him for you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you have to realize in, in, a, in a show or a game or any kind of a project like that, there are so many different divisions of people that, that work on it, and only in the situation like this, where this show became really popular, uh, have we had the opportunity to meet uh, the composers or meet the writers or meet uh, the animators, uh, even a lot of the management team. It, it normally doesn't happen, at, at least not for uh, the, uh, the voice actor side, it normally doesn't happen that people uh, cross over this much. And it's been wonderful that we get to meet uh, everybody even in different cities, but normally in those kinds of projects you don't, you only work with the people that are in your exact department. And, and you often never meet the people on the other side of the things. Yeah. Thank you very much. Alright, so this is a two-pronged question for Will. Um, how was it, how different was it doing a dubstep track? And as a composer for a show, are you forced to do a lot of different genres that you might not be? I always say that animation composing is one of the toughest gigs in the business. We have to write all styles, uh, and you have to uh, do a lot of music in a short amount of time. And so it's a relentless, uh, hard work week. You know, it takes 50 to 60 hours to score the show right, and we just get a week of show. And um, and the dubstep thing, I, I um, Jason and I dreamed it up. Uh, I had written some electronic, more like progressive house stuff for, for uh, DJ Pons in his earlier incarnation. Uh, and, and I guess it became popular out on the internet and Jason said, you know what, Will, you almost made this guy, you know? He's just supposed to be three seconds and, and now. And so they decided in Show 100 to really give him something big and he just said, why don't you just go write a dubstep piece uh, like a three, four minute instrumental and, and we'll cut the picture to it and, and make it like a little music video. And I don't remember, oh no, and of course, yeah, Octavia is going to be in it, so do, let's do it with cello. 
And, and so that's how it happened. It was, it was just like that. And I, I started writing something, and I, I sent him like a kind of a sketch. You know, I sketched in some synth cello parts and, and a groove and an arrangement. And, and uh, they loved it immediately and just said, okay, go for it. And that's, that's what happened. Thank you. Good question. Thank yeah. you. People know the old-fashioned way. Okay, I'm sure you're, uh, you know, so you're uh, all very familiar with uh, Carl Stone Project and Bugs Bunny on Broadway. Uh, do you think that a, a full live uh, mini orchestra thing like uh, Bugs Bunny on Broadway uh, would be doable with uh, My Little Pony? And who do we have to blackmail to make it happen? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's a great thing to do. Sure. And, uh, uh, and of course, I have very little influence uh, to get that done. Uh, but yeah, wouldn't that be fun? I mean, that's kind of what Tina and I are doing tonight. We're, we're going to run the film from the from the dubstep thing while we play. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, yeah. We'll be the seeds of it. All right, thank you much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I get the deluxe films. <laughs> First of all, I just want to thank Hope. Oh. You broke it. <laughs> <laughs> Those things suck batteries. Check, check. <laughs> thank you. First of all, I want to thank everybody up here for your contribution. Really, really love it. Uh, and also, Tina, I want to thank you. My girlfriend's studying for her executive MBA, and it's, it's brutal, and she has a serious to get through it. Oh, oh, absolutely. Um, my question is for you, though. I wanted to find out, uh, and I don't know if you've done any collaboration or if you've thought about it. Uh, but those two uh, Croatian cellos, two cellos. Yeah, they're awesome. Yeah. Have you ever thought of maybe doing something with them? Um, yeah, I would love to. I mean, it's, doing collaborations with people is kind of, it's not complicated, but, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of times it has to do with, like, the labels or, like, you know, a lot of the brands and management. So um, I haven't met them personally. Because um, if you're, like, personally friends with someone, like, you know, the other people I play with, then you can just say, hey, let's do something. So call, advice for college students entering a music major. Oh, what kind of music major? It, uh, yeah, exactly. Like a performance or composition? Or, Classical, like composition and story. Well, um, learn from everybody you're studying with. Actually, uh, and then just go hustle work. Uh, I know a lot of people say try to get any job you can, and even after you do it for free, that's okay. I feel that's not good for the community, and so I don't, even if I have somebody working for me to do something and I'm not getting paid, I pay them and I have since I had very little, and I always will do that. Uh, but it's really, uh, uh, for me, the degree never got, did much to advance my career. It was all hustle, finding work, making it happen, making sure they liked me, never having an attitude, getting it done by when they said, uh, doing my best work always, Staying in touch with them. I've never had a, an agent. I've been self-represented my whole career, and it's just being grateful and doing your best work and staying in touch. Education is is so important. If somebody works for me, I like for them to have a composition degree. You know, I mean. So I went to school for cello performance, um, but then I started actually getting really busy and performing, so then I left school. But um, I think, you know, going into a music major, we talked about this a little bit earlier, music, just like anything else we do, it's, you know, it's difficult. There's a lot of people, it's very competitive, um, and definitely what Will said about just being, first of all, being, just being nice, you know, like I think 
ego is probably the worst thing anyone can have in envy. Maybe a little bit, you know, it's, it's okay, but just being a really nice person, uh, staying humble, trying to work, like for me at least, you know, try, try to do the best that you can and always deliver them, deliver more than you promise, you know? So just, I don't know, work hard, be nice, be nice to people. Thank Good you. stuff. When you were writing the uh, background scores for the uh, episodes, do you delve more into the psyche of the ponies that the scene is playing out with, or the um, interactions and the events that's happening in the episode? Like, which one plays into it more? Both of those scenes play, and that's a good question. Uh, like I said, I spend over two hours before I write a note on each episode. And there's different facets of the score, like there's what I call the uh, linear psychological point of view, getting the gestures, hitting the emotional beats and reactions, and that's like when they're just talking and or walking and it's it's exposition, that's like the hardest thing to do. And and you because you want to tell the story, you want to be character specific without being too on the nose. This is not an on the nose Bugs Bunny type of cartoon. Uh, and uh, um, it, it's important to capture the the big emotions that are are most relevant to the story. And then there's the parts of the show often that are, there's big set pieces, whether it's the end of a climactic two-parter or, 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 or a crazy race uh, through neighborhood. And you know, the, the set pieces are treated more like big Hollywood epic scores. And uh, those are nice because they're defined and you just go after them until you get them right. They're big, they're hard, they take a long time. It's the elusive, uh, because the good underscore for the character is an exposition and catching the gestures and which reactions to mark and, and you want to do it in a way that's in, invisible, that draws too much attention to itself and you're listening to the score, that's not the job. You almost want to know, you almost don't, it wants to be invisible. And um, those are, that to me is the trickiest part of, of really any score. Uh, it, uh, and I call it the linear, um, psychological point of view, character, gesture, and story, tell the story part. <laughs> well, I know that uh, the music, since I'm musically inclined, definitely keeps me, uh, keeps my attention during the episode, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can we get a little more of that? So, not from the, uh, in the monitor, a little bit of the, the question mic up here. Sorry, awesome, you. thank you. Hey, it's really nice to meet you. <laughs> uh, I still can't hear her. <laughs> I said, yay, it's short enough for me. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so, uh, short question, and then a regular late like, question. Short one, uh, you said that you were working on like the 20th episode a couple of weeks ago. How close to the airing date are you working on the, are you working on the episodes? I'm close, you know. Uh, uh, Monique and Michelle and Daniel are what they call pre-production because the, Samuel, the, the, the songs have to shift with the dialogue record, which is then slugged to time and animated. Uh, in post-production, the effects, the ADR, and the, and the post, and the score, they used to call it a post-score. Uh, we, that's, I get a locked print that's exactly what you see on air. And, uh, you know, and so I'm, I'm, I, I'm um, I think I'm just about, I finish it and it's on the air in about two or three weeks. Wow. Whereas, um, yeah, as you say, we're like the bookends. Um, the, uh, the script is written, the, uh, the actors then record the script and we record the songs. Uh, and then you write the songs, of course. We record the songs. And then it goes to animation, which is a very long process, and goes for scoring at the very end. So for for us, the things that we do don't air for usually at least a year after we do them. Um, and you'll often find uh, when you ask people questions on in any part of the process what they did on this episode, it's that, hard. They, that they look like they can't remember, and it's because you can't. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> so many so episodes ago. Yeah. <laughs> It's funny, in, in the studio, like when I go up to DHX, or, or really anything, I mean, on any of the other shows, it's always funny for me. In, in pre-production, when they're recording all the scripts, you go into the studio and there's 150 people working on Cintiq monitors and on drafting boards, and it's just teeming with life. 
when I come to do my job, it's a ghost town. I go into the studio and the room is gutted and empty. There's more executive producers left and, and everybody's left the building. It's, 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 it's post. <laughs> oh, but for a second. Is it okay if I have a second one? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, my boyfriend is a composer as well, and he's recently started getting his foot into the business, and he's working on a proposition with uh, 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 commission for a proposition by Nintendo. We're really excited about it. I'm hoping it works. And we're, he's trying to figure out, like, he loves to compose, and he loves uh, uh, scoring and everything. But at the same time, he also wants to, like, keep his, art, keep his inner artist happy. Like, do the, things that, do the things that make him happy. How do you do both, um, like, being a professional composer and keeping your inner artist happy? I've always been so grateful just to work that I, I've never had that distinction. A friend of mine, uh, when I, I used to play, like, in, you know, a, like a punk new wave band back in the day. And, uh, and, and when I started getting jobs scoring commercials and stuff, we didn't never made any money, and, and, and and uh, he was he was all like, you know, I couldn't do that. It would affect, you know, my egg as an artist, and we, you know. And I was like, God, Joe's pizza truck needs a, a jingle, and it's 50 bucks? I don't know, it sounds better than working at Bonds, you know? And, and, uh, so I've never had that. I've always been so grateful to, to be able to write music for a living. Uh, and, and I also feel, like I look at uh, commercial artists that come to their own voice later in life because they've had the time to refine their craft over and over. Uh, Jerry Goldsmith and John Williams in the golden ages of television had offices on the Universal lot writing for all like uh, all those you know Wild Wild West and all those shows and he wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote. Uh, 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 Ken Follett wrote many novels as just page turner thrillers before he did pillars of the earth which is just a masterpiece of of, of, of literature and and he came to get that craft because you know he wrote thousands of you know many other books so i think commercial art is a is a great way to pay your bills while you refine and find your own voice that's a really good way to work to look at it yeah <laughs> All music is music. All art is art. I might be a little bit biased because I, my, my ex-boyfriend actually was a. We had a band together. I'm not gonna say his name, so I'm not, you know, bad mouthing anyone in public. But uh, he, he was a, you know, aspiring artist for basically his entire life, and he refused to get a job because he said, and he refused to make any money because he said, no, I'm an artist. I don't want to do anything except my own music. Of course, I broke up with him, but. For me, also, anything that I work on, whether it's My Little Pony, or my classical music, or metal, or playing on like a pop artist track, or a touring with you know Alicia Keys, it, like, it doesn't matter, it's all, it, in the end, it, it is all music, and you know, yeah, I, I definitely feel lucky for any opportunity I get to play my instrument or do anything that's even music related. Mm -hmm. so, that's and also, he's a really big fan of his Tina, so he wants to say hi. Oh, hi! <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs> So, I think uh, William uh, invited a couple of people to crash the panel, and he may have made a mistake by doing that, but uh, <laughs> I think they're here, so I'm wondering if, uh, if they would like to come on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Michelle Freeman. Hello. Uh oh, my mic's on. That's the first mistake I made. <laughs> oh, yeah, here it is. Okay. So, for those of you, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure a lot of you are in the know. Uh, Michelle is the voice of Apple Bloom and the singing voice of Sweetie Bill uh, for most of Sweetie Bill's songs. And uh, uh, so, uh, as such, uh, and she's also the singer for Apple Bloom, so she has sung many songs from the show over the years, and uh, Black Griffin uh, was recently singing, uh, he did some vocals on the first episode of this season, he's also on the latest CD that just came out, in fact they're both on the latest CD that just came out, uh, what's that, what is that CD called again? Songs of Harmony, I think. 
Is that and it? I, I, me yeah. and I think Rebecca did the Witcher so wrap up and True True Friend mashup shot, Ooh. which was really fun. And then what song did you? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Is the heart so strong as horses on that? You know what? We should I love your answer. <laughs> I, I always get you know on episode thirteen uh, in the second season where you referencing Jerry Goldsmith's Gremlin yeah. score. <laughs> and I just go blank. Um, um, what do you think? Well, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, we should know the answers to this. Um, <laughs> in fact, the first CD that came out, uh, Michelle was on, or maybe it was the second one, she was on several songs, and we didn't even know she was on it until I happened, a, a fan actually sent a link to it on iTunes, and then uh, I looked at it and went, oh my goodness, she's on three or four songs on the CD. And then after that, then we got some paperwork to do with the, with the, the CD. So it's, it's funny, like a lot of times, uh, the Equestria Girls was the same thing. We actually didn't know Michelle was in the Equestria Girls movie. She recorded the lines for it a year before, and we didn't realize. It, well, it wasn't actually going to be a feature film at first, I don't think. We didn't realize. And then somebody said, well, if you're not, they asked her if she was in the movie, and she said no. And they said, well, then who's voicing Apple Bloom? So we looked at it on IMDb and went, oh, yes, she is in that movie. <laughs> <laughs> and then we looked the contract and oh, yeah, she did do a session on that. So that's what we mean by it's hard to uh, keep track of things that you've done. Jason and I always wanted it to be a feature. And when, when it was first coming out, first he told me, you know, they're all going to be teenagers and, and human. And, and, and we were all looking at each other like, oh my god, you know. <laughs> because the, the show had become so successful, and I was like, is this going to kill us all? <laughs> but then we got on board with the idea, and, and when we sat down and talked about the music, I go, Jason, let's just score it like it's an animated feature. Let's score it like we're Pixar or Disney or whatever. And, uh, and then by the time we were done with it, they released it as a feature. So, you know, it was fun. Yeah, no, nice bonus. <laughs> Anyway, sorry for the long delay for the next question. Come on up. Thank you. Hello? Okay, uh, this is a question for Will. Uh, I think it's kind of two questions. The first question is, uh, how much of your scoring in the show is MIDI and how much of it is, is real uh, instruments? It's almost all MIDI. It's, it's uh, uh, predominantly, I use the East West Symphonic Orchestra Library, top to bottom, from pick to double bass. But I use the Vienna woodwinds because they have more point and less room. And then it's just a whole grab bag of whatever I need, you know, because there are a little different styles. But all the same stuff, the native instruments, plugins, uh, the you know, symphobia or omnisphere or stylus or battery or addictive drums and, and trillion, you know. Uh, I have to ask you to write that down for me a second. We'll, we'll look good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't. No, no, it's okay. Um, I was, I was, I was uh, the second question is, what makes you decide when to use a real instrument, and what made you decide to use a real cello for the one who has It's rare that I have time, you know, because we do a show a week. Yeah. But when, when it comes, you know, if it, it's, 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 it's always, you know, I can have a, I think they call it a blend score, you know, when you have a couple of live players come in. And, and I do that anytime I can, because I love having real players. But then, uh, also as time permits and the situation merits. There was just a show a couple weeks ago where there was a montage with uh, uh, Applejack doing some things. And uh, I wanted real banjo in it to, to, to elevate it. So I got my buddy uh, Jim West, who's in Weird Al's man. They're on tour. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I will actually plug my buddy Al and all guys in the I recorded and toured with, with Al way back in the day, and, and, and he still is triumphant, and his, his tour is selling out everywhere, and, and they're getting great reviews. But Kimo's on the bus, and I just emailed him and said, can you, uh, well, I told him, do you still have your $100 banjo with you? <laughs> and uh, he said, yeah, and, and, I, and he, he plays, you know, I, I sent him the track, and he knocked out some banjo in his hotel room, and he emailed it back, and, and it popped it right in the show. You know, it took him an hour to, to do it, and, uh, you know, when it's like that, it's very convenient. Wow. Thank you very much. And, um, uh, okay, I was just going to say, <laughs> Andrew, are we okay to go a little bit over since we got started later? Are you going to do what I did? We're okay? Okay. We'll go a little longer then, but we would like to try to get through as many questions as possible so if we can. Uh, okay, 10 minutes. Here we go. Let's power through some questions. Yeah. 
Hope I'm not blocking other people here. Well, Tina. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so any position within five minutes? Oh, there, I couldn't. I, I mean, really. I mean, I just appreciate talent. I, I guess we're at Wrong stand. Probably Michael Jackson. I just really like Michael Jackson. Yeah. So, Rellis. Hello. Well, so this question, I'm interested to see if there's a lot of uniformity or variation in your answer. And the question is, where do you draw your music inspiration from, and what does your process look like from start to finish? Deadlines. <laughs> It has to get on air, you have to finish, and sometimes you have to send your children out in the world before they are ready. <laughs> and you have to sketch fast and make a lot of paintings, and not all of them are going to be perfect, but you try to get better over time. Uh, my process is to get all the most important beats done right, and, and uh, it's, it's tough. You know, television, animation, you have to, you have to, you have to sketch fast and make a lot of paintings. Um, did I answer your question? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, deadlines. I'm serious. I'll fiddle around in the queue for the rest of my life unless I have a deadline. Were you asking that question for everyone? Yes. Is that all right? Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah, inspiration varies, I guess, depending on the song. Um, uh, I think, um, actually, the thing when I kind of like the electronic music sound because he's always had electronic uh, keyboards and stuff way back in the day before he was sequencing, just playing stuff. And um, our music, a lot of people say our music sounds a lot like Al City. We were writing stuff like that before Al City came out. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> no, I'm not saying, I'm saying, I mean, well, we do love Al City, but we're not copying this kind of, but I, I draw obviously some inspiration from Michael Jackson. A little like Michael Jackson. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it depends on what I'm like, you know, the mood that I'm in. If I hear something really inspiring, then I'll try to write a song that's similar to that. Or if I see something inspiring, I'll write a song based off of what I saw. Our, our process, some, it also varies. We just wrote a song in like two days, and it happened so fast that Nathaniel just exactly. Yeah, exactly. We had a deadline. So, so, having a deadline. We wanted yeah. to have a new song performed tonight. So just we just kind of pooped it out and didn't over it. <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's the official term. That's the most eloquent way of putting it. This is um, the, the new track that we pooped out. Eleven o'clock tonight. Be there and you will see the poop. You'll see the poop. Well, everybody's already talked about the deadline thing, which of course you know. But I think for um, for me. You know, music is art, it's expression, just like any kind of art, actually anything in the world, if you're a business person, if you're, all of it is just expression. So for me, uh, my inspiration comes from feelings. I know it sounds super cheesy, feelings, but it, it's true, you know? So if, if you feel, for me, you know, like maybe feeling weird or, I don't know, dorky, because, you know, when I was like, I was super, you know, with my big cello walking around like a turtle, you know, and, <laughs> you know, orchestra geek or whatnot, but, um, and then, you know, relationships, boyfriends, falling in love, having fights, breaking up, stuff like that. So it's all, for me, all the inspiration comes from being a, uh, being a human being. That's a fantastic answer. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Hello. So my question is for William. I studied conducting a composition school, and I am really terrible at just sitting down getting stuff written on paper. So you obviously being forced to be very prolific, uh, what do you do to just sit down and knock out what you need to get knocked out? Yeah, I don't put it on the page for this kind of job. I, I, I first I find the, the I find the, uh, something that brings, I always have the picture in the dialogue running because my art is to serve that and tell the story. 
and I try to find the first thought that brings it alive or does what need it create the sense of mystery or adventure or excitement or tension that it needs. I find whether it's a, a tempo or a percussion, just some kind of sound that sounds cool and brings it alive. And I find that and I sketch it out for uh, you know the, the minute or the, whatever the scene is, and then I just fill it in. You know, uh, starting with what I think is most important. You know, and sometimes I fill it in too much. I color it in too much, and it gets too too big. And and I start experimenting with dropping some of the instruments out uh, and 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 making it so that it's just more clear and economical. I strive to just be essential and not overproduce. The, you know, the, the cue, it just needs to be what it needs to be. It's important not to just flex your muscles every time, you know? It has a job to do, and it's, I just try to keep it there. But yeah, I, I find it, I, and then I color it in, and then I print it, I mix it as I'm writing, uh, and, and then I just move relentlessly forward. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Powerful, so yeah. Um, what's your favorite metal band, and then what's your favorite concert? Oh, cool. uh, I like old school Metallica. Um, Woo! Yeah! I know I said Ramstein already like 20 million times, but they're not really, I mean, are they metal? I don't know, they're more industrial, so I love Ramstein. Uh, favorite concerto, uh, uh, maybe the Elgar concerto, because it's very depressing but beautiful. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hello. Um, I just have a question for Tina. Um, what keeps you motivated to do the work that you do at Life? Um, what keeps me motivated? Honestly, my parents, who were crazy tiger dragon parents, <laughs> um, they, no, like psychologically, no, truly, because like, I've analyzed myself. I'm like, why am, why am I such a workaholic? Why can I not? Relax, which is actually a problem that I'm trying to work on that myself. Um, but uh, I, you know, they've instilled into my brain. I just always hear them saying to me, uh, what, well, it's in Chinese, so what would the equivalent be? Well, don't waste time, don't waste time, be productive, don't worry, what did you do today, you know? So, of course, too much of that is unhealthy, I know, but um, so part of it, a lot of it, I think I can attribute to my parents just like drilling it into my head, which made for a very miserable childhood. However, I am very. <laughs> Very, very grateful for it now, truly, because a lot of times, you know, anything, I think anything worth doing, anything to do really well, you have to sacrifice something. So my sacrifice was my childhood, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, no, and then I just, for me, I, I love, I really love creating, you know, music, pictures, videos. I do a lot of music videos, one per month. And for me, it's just about, you know, creating stuff and having fun. And I'm, you know, lucky to be able to, to do that. So. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, before I ask my question, I wanted to make a comment and say thanks to Will and Tina for being so nice to me and my mom yesterday at lunch. Oh. Um, You're okay. welcome. So a question for Tina. How long have you playing have you been playing your cello? Well, I'm turning 30 in two months, and I started cello when I was uh, seven, so 20, almost 23 years. Yeah. Thank you. I love you. your cosplay. <laughs> so cute. I didn't write any of that. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I mean, I'm not kidding. Are, aren't we talking about Daniel's songs? I'm just saying Daniel and yours both. You guys are both. I wish Daniel was here too this, this time. I yeah, uh, I mean, no. I think it's great that they're putting this stuff out on record. And if, if there's a petition to uh, release some of the scores, and, and I know that people would like to see it, and I'm all for that too. It'd be really fun to like let the fans pick out their 
whatever, 15 favorite scenes from everything we've done and then remaster all those cues and, and put them out on the record. So, yeah, thank you. That's great. Oh, and uh, I wanted to thank, uh, I never got a chance to since the tweet video came out. Thank you, Michelle and, and Ms. Monique for everything during the, the panel at the 2013. I was in on the video scenes. Thank I you. I remember you from there. And, and yes, that was the last time that uh, we did a convention here in LA, and a lot of you did participate, and I know it was a late night. But thank you for doing that. And then uh, Black Griffin was still in Japan at that time, but he still participated greatly. He helped yeah. write the song and produce it. But the video was stage. really popular. That and stage, we felt like we were falling to the stage. I don't remember how many people were called in that stage when, you did, you know, when we were singing. That was crazy. It was late a lot. Night, you're right. Yeah, thank you very much for participating. I think that's the phone that cut out because my battery was going dead on the recording devices. Nice stuff. Hello? Uh, hi there. Um, my question is for Tina. I wanted to ask you, you said that you were growing up, you know, when you know, your parents made you want to play the cello. So when was the point for you that you decided that heavy metal was a part of your life? Sorry, I'm really like this because I actually moved to here and didn't know that. That's why it's hard to hear. Sorry. Sorry, can you hear me? Sorry. Um, what did you say? Uh, the when was the, are still hard to hear. When was the point in your life that heavy metal and all that kind of music became a big piece? Oh, uh, okay. So I've always, you know, growing up, we weren't allowed to listen to anything but classical music because, again, my parents were classical musicians also. Um, so I only, I only managed to sneak in two CDs, or actually they were tapes, so two cassette tapes into our home uh, before I was 18, before I went to college. One was the Guns N' Roses' Appetite for Destruction. Woo! Woo! Uh, also Tina, so Tina, you know, she like, she's like, here, here, check this out. Um, and then in, uh, I was in sixth grade, and there's this guy that I had a crush on. He was like a, a goth guy that was really, I remember like big glasses, like really thick, like Coke bottle glasses, and his name was Luke. And he gave me, uh, he let me borrow his Marilyn Manson, um, any kind of superstar album. So, awesome. so, the, so the, that was really like my only exposure to harder, heavier music, aside from classical and you know random radio stuff. Um, so I, you know, I really loved. I think for me it was more of just like my parents said, oh, you can't listen to that. That's evil. That's bad. You know, you gotta do that. And I, of course, you want to do what you can't do. So, um, and uh, when I went to college, that's when I started experimenting. I got an electric cello and I started really listening and exploring other genres of music. I went to you know the Hollywood. I strip and went to different clubs to listen to local bands and stuff, so that's what happened. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, I, sorry, I hear that. Uh, and you were putting your questions there, is that correct? Okay, so thank you very much. Sorry if we didn't have a chance to get to everybody. Uh, I, again, uh, William and Tina will be performing their song from the 100th episode tonight at 7 p.m. Uh, to kick off the uh, lunar... It's three minutes long, so don't be late. <laughs> yeah, do not be late. It is only three minutes long. And then at 11 o'clock, uh, Michelle and Black Griffin take the stage uh, with basic. Uh, the three of them will be performing uh, hits from uh, their immortal uh, new songs that they've written on the upcoming CD and Timeless and all sorts and, um, and the Jackson stuff, uh, the Jackson tribute stuff. So, uh, Woo! Uh, Woo! Anything else you guys are doing today? Um, yeah, actually, if, if anyone wants to, I don't know if you'll even, well, of course, you can come too, but we have a, um, I'm doing a meet and greet at 1230. Okay. And we'll maybe, well, maybe he doesn't want to. No, no, I'll come hang out. Yeah, I'll come hang out. Yeah, 1230 to 130, and then we're doing autographs from 145 to 315. And also, if, I know some people didn't get to ask their questions. If it was for me or, or you know, I'll, 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 I'll hang out up front after the panel, and I'm, I'm free to address any lingering issues that we don't want to have. So thank you very much, Ms. Tina Guo. Woo! Yeah! Thank you for listening. Woo! 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 So you know she also uh, has support on my little pony. I don't think you probably said that, but she directed the choir who sang on Smile Song, Heart of Carol, oh, no, at the gala. At the gala. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Thank you for coming to our panel.